Every company needs a logo. We all know that. But why? Not only why, but how. Join us today as we discuss logo design on today's Straight Shot Marketing Podcast. Welcome to Straight Shot. Marketing is everywhere. It's around your life. From what you eat to what you wear and where you go. It is a vital part of any and all business. Let's discuss the world of marketing and business as it influences everyday life with the staff of Atlanta Marketing Agency, Reformation Productions, and guests as they give it to us straight. Get ready. Take aim. Steady. Welcome to Straight Shot. Welcome, Straight Shooters. My name is Jennifer, and I am here with B. Zachary Bennett. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Please like and subscribe wherever you are listening to or watching this podcast. It really helps us a lot with the algorithms. Um, if you enjoy our content and find value in this show, also please leave a, a review for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any of our social media outlets. All right, now today. Today, we are going to discuss logo design. Now, logos are imperative, and they usually happen early on in a business's journey, right behind their brand name. So, let's start right there. Zachary, talk to me about the start of a company's journey. Well, um, everyone's journey is the same, and everyone's journey is different. Um, most businesses need and take the same steps and do the same work, but they don't always use the same process or the same order to complete those steps. Now, my recommendation is that you start with your planning. Yes. Okay. And you actually go through this early stages a lot in your book, Married to marketing. Cue the graphic. So I'm not going to get into all of the vision projecting in the background homework here, or this episode would then turn into being about that instead of about logo design. Uh, But suffice to say that I recommend starting with planning for your business operations and analyzing the marketplace first, because that information will be necessary when going into brand development. Now, brand development is about determining how to communicate your persona, your image, to your audience, and how to meet them strategically for the purposes of your business's goals. So do your internal thinking and your pen to paper when considering your vision, your offerings, and how you're going to operate before thinking about what to call it or what it should look like. But don't enter the marketplace until you've started brand development. Now, you start there because that is the information that will be asked of you when you get into developing your brand and your communication strategies. Now, we'll go into all the details of brand development in another episode sometime in the future. But today, we are discussing just one part of the identification session that is within brand development. So, anyway, once you have that initial work done, the very next thing should be determining your brand name followed by your logo. I do not recommend starting with your brand name or logo first. And this is a very, very common mistake that new business owners and entrepreneurs make. Your brand name is very important and should not be determined without doing that deep thinking first. Okay, well then let's start there then. Talk to me about brand names. It's an age old question, Zachary. What's in a name? (laughs) Well, if you're in the business of launching a brand new product or business, the answer is everything. David Plasic is considered to be an expert at this. He's known as the namer. And he charges upwards of $100,000 for naming a brand or product. What? His work includes the Subaru Outback, OnStar, uh, the Pentium chip, um, Dasani for Coke, water. Okay, this makes sense now. <laughs> Blackberry, 
Swiffer. Oh, Swiffer. Really? When, yes. Oh. When a company invests that much in a name, you better believe it's important. Now, brand names started off as family names. You know, you have Singer and Hoover and Ford. But as the marketplace grew, this became less feasible and less effective. There were more Fords in the world inventing stuff than just Henry Ford, right? Uh, but as the marketplace grew, companies wanted more out of their name. They wanted more meaning and purpose and to use it as a tool to get ahead of their competition in the marketplace. Okay, so what makes a good name today? A good name is distinctive. It's appropriate. It conveys uh, subtle meanings and ideas. Uh, it reads and sounds appropriate. And it is easy to pronounce. That is, it, it rolls off the tongue. An effective name should be memorable, unique, timeless, attractive to your um, customer target, right? Invoke sound symbolism. Ooh. So for our audience listening, what is sound symbolism? In linguistics, sound symbolism, phonesia or phonosomatics is the idea that vocal sounds or phonemes carry meaning in and of themselves, that they invoke certain qualities. That's how strawberry became blackberry. You remember the tool blackberry? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It was it, called it strawberry? It was called strawberry. They changed it because the sound B was was better had better quality for what they were trying to do than strawberry. It's also how they came up with words like swiffer, which isn't a real word. Well, yeah, but that's a sound word. It's like a like onomatopoeia. Bo both of them. Is that an onomatopoeia or a, what's the other one? Both of them were done because of the way they sound. This whole thing could be its own episode too. So we're going to move forward <laughs> so that we stay on today's topic. So after we have the name, now we get to the logo. So what is the purpose of a logo and why do they matter? Yeah, so after the initial vision casting and operational thought, we develop the name, then the logo. And the purpose of the logo is very similar to the purpose of the name, but it adds a visual element and an additional emotional element to it as well. The primary role of a logo is to identify the business to the public visually. Identification is what really matters. Design trends come and go. Design tools and techniques, they change. But the most important goal of a logo will always be to identify the person, product, or company you are designing it for. From this big picture way of looking at it, the logo is also the simplest form of visual communications in business. It's like a signature as opposed to a name. Oh, interesting. So it's like the scrawled X that identifies someone that can't write just as much as the flamboyant signature <laughs> of the John Hancock. Both of those are used to identify the person. Correct. And the swastika was used to oh. identify the Nazi party and the rings that identify the Olympics and the graphic marks that represent the companies like Nike and Apple and McDonald's and product logos like Pampers and Lexus. They are all used for identification. The importance of that purpose is paramount. Just like we discussed the brand names earlier, logos help separate companies in a sea of competition. And it's even more true today. Before, there were few companies operating within a particular niche, and now there are hundreds, if not thousands, all competing uh, for attention, all wanting their audience to consider them First, that creates an increasing need for brands to differentiate themselves visually so that they're not confused with their competitors. Okay, so this is something graphic designers and business owners really need to understand before they can begin logo design. That driving purpose helps shape the direction that they will take and the decisions that they will make. A logo is a strategic 
tool. It's not simply art. It's not just a thing of beauty or something that the business owner likes the look of. It is a tool that will allow the company to be identified from that point forward for generations if you're successful enough. Now, it can also be appealing to look at, but that's secondary to its true purpose, which is becoming the visual signatory element for the business. It is form and function. Yes. Yes. So now that we know what it is, why do logos matter? Why are they so important? They are the face of the business product or service. When you picture a business in your mind, you're often going to see the logo. And likewise, you will also associate that picture in your mind's eye with memories, experiences, and interactions that you've had with that brand. So when we see a well-known logo, what we perceive isn't just the word or the image, but all the associations that we have accrued with it over time. Exactly. And because of that, a brand new logo can appear to have very little meaning in the beginning because in a way it's an empty cup or sponge just waiting for all of the meaning that's going to be poured into it over the company's journey by history and experience. Michael Beirut calls it an empty vessel. The best thing a designer can do is make that vessel the right shape and the right color for what is going to go into it in the future. Now, talk to me again about the swastika. The swastika has nothing inherently wrong with it as a mark. Okay. But that logo has been filled with so much hatred and bad experience that it will likely it'll likely never recover. Bad, You'll never be able to use the swastika on someone. A star you can use, a box you can use, a triangle you can use. Swastika, no use. Now, uh, a lot of creatives, including those designers here at the agency, will aim to attach a hidden meaning to a logo. But that's not a requirement. It's nice, but it's not a requirement. The focus should be always on identification. Meaning can be added by time and people's experiences and their interaction with the brand. Okay, so let's dive into that. Uh, let's talk what designers might face when they're trying to design a look. Okay, but I have to stay kind of cerebral here for a minute. Oh, sure. So more of the thinking aspects that go into design first. Uh, in addition to understanding its driving purpose and because of this big picture purpose, a designer or a business owner, before working on any ideas, needs to fully understand their landscape, the marketplace, in which that logo is going to be seen. Who are the brand's competitors? How do they look? What are the colors and symbols that are already owned by your competitors, right? Um, how can you differentiate your new logo so that your business is going to stand out from others? Again, identification. You have to be identifiable by this mark. It also needs to represent the company, okay? Their brand mission and support the company's strategic positioning, which is why those elements need to be established first, if at all possible. Seriously? Warning to all of you out there. It's also why you shouldn't trust your logo design to the new Wix logo designer or <laughs> someone on Fiverr. Now, with that being said, and now known by the business community, let's discuss the practical rules and guidelines for making a good logo. Okay, well, there are several things beyond the big picture that we need to remember. One is that our goals as a designer is to establish instant brand recognition. So a well-designed logo should be memorable. It will help customers to remember the brand. And we know through psychology and science that shapes and colors are easier for humans to process and remember than mere words. So two of the reasons for using logos, 
to identify the company or product and to encourage memorability and recognition. We also need to recognize that logo design influences our decisions as consumers. All humans have collected a visual library in their minds since they've been able to see, and they've been automatically, subconsciously, most of them, begun to associate fonts, shapes, and colors with specific emotions and objects. Now, because of that, simply looking at a logo, whether it appeals to us or not, we will immediately form an opinion make prejudgments and have perceptions of the business product or service. It could be that we think that the company looks too expensive or too corporate or too fun or too radical, which might lead us to avoid it. Other logos may make us think the company is too cheap or too conservative for our taste. Same result. But On the same page, if the logo looks and feels like the type of company, products, or services that we are looking for, wish to associate with, or are into, right, you're into them, (laughs) then we will actively engage with the brand by its products and services, follow them on social media, etc. Right, and this is why it's paramount that the logo correctly represents uh, the business. You want to attract the right audience, not turn them away. Right. Now, in the same way, logos form expectations in the minds of the public. And if the company fails to meet those expectations, things will go bad. Or if the logo is positioned to attract the wrong audience, things will go bad as well. You will have just wasted time and money serving people that won't actually become your customers. You could also get bad reviews and talk from those that would have been the right audience for you. Okay, next. You <laughs> you want to create a good first impression. There is so much competition in the marketplace. A company has one chance to impress and attract. If the logo design fails to impress, it is very easy for your audience to go elsewhere. With the internet, competitors are literally at your fingertips. Again, to bang my drum, this is why it's very important to do it right. Now, I know that some business owners try to do it themselves or they use low cost amateur designers, but I believe that's because they do not understand how damaging poor design can be for them. First impressions matter so much. Okay, so this is my last warning on this. Maybe, I don't know. (laughs) But let's just remember the old saying, there's nothing more expensive than cheap design. This statement sums up the losses the company is causing by accepting the cheapest and quickest route. Yes. Number four, Moving, moving right along. Your logo communicates the company's brand values and additional meanings. Now, While a logo's primary function is to identify, coupled with the other things that I've mentioned here, logos can also be leveraged to communicate important brand messages and values. Now, I told you earlier that it didn't have to, but it can. Just make sure you keep it very simple, very easy to digest. Now, an example, the logo design for Amazon has multiple hidden meanings in added value messages. There is a curved line that goes from the A to the Z, indicating that they have a wide breadth of products. Everything from A A to Z. Z. (laughs) And additionally, that line also makes us smile, communicating the happiness of receiving something that you've ordered. Now, This positivity is enhanced by the vibrant use of the color orange, often associated with fun, sunshine, and warmth. Uh, Now, another one that has these added messages, um, the logo for the courier shipping company, Federal Express, is very corporate. 
and professional looking because its original core audience was the business community, right? Corporate America was who they served. UPS served the peoples. FedEx served uh, the, the, business. the business, right? But in addition to it being corporate looking, it also has an arrow cleverly hidden within the negative space of the E and the X to symbolize speed and forward motion. Now, how, well, let me just say this way. I think a lot of our audience members here uh, probably found that out at some point. And how cool was it when you discovered that arrow in FedEx? Super great, right? So if you don't already know those examples, you will never be able to look at those same logos again. Right, that's true. Well, not the same way. That, anyway. since, since I was first taught about the FedEx logo, every time I look at a truck, I see it. I mean, it's the first right. thing that screams and out And people will now. come to me saying, hey, did you know? Because everybody gets very proud of themselves <laughs> when they figure it out. Okay, the fifth and last on my list of why logo design is important is that it can provide you with an additional revenue stream. Companies like Coca-Cola, Adidas, Nike, Under Armour, the Rolling Stones, and many, many more all have extra revenue that is derived directly from putting their logo on items. Separate from their main business, additional income streams, all because their logo design and what it means to the public, what their brand means to the public. So, Mr. or Mrs. Designer, by truly understanding the role of a logo design, you can create stronger brand identities that will perform for the business rather than just creating a pretty picture. A good logo is distinctive, appropriate, practical, graphic, simple in form, and it conveys an intended message. But it is not easy. Didn't say it was easy. <laughs> now, uh, an effective logo will also be, um, you know, I said simple, memorable, timeless, versatile. Ah, and that means able to be printed in various ways. Big, small, inversed, on dark, on light, black and white, etc. Yeah, most most uh, companies, when they make their logo, they have to make sure that it's, they also have a horizontal version and a stacked version. Stack means up and down, um, y'all. Yeah. Uh, it also has to be appropriate for the industry or the business, and it has to be attractive to your consumer target. Mm -hmm. A lot of weight going on these logos. Yeah, they're a big deal. Yeah. They might even be very simple. Don't, don't get confused. Just because they look simple does not mean it was easy to make. Right. So let's talk about those nuts and bolts now. Let's discuss the five types of logos. Okay. I'll list them. You explain. Okay. Number one, the icon it is a symbol or graphic. And we'll throw up examples of this up on the screen for those that are watching us on a video. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Number right. one. Um, sometimes these icons can be literal, like the symbol for... Apple is... An apple. An apple. The symbol for Shell gas stations is... Oh, I know this. A Shell. <laughs> and the symbol for Target is... A Target. A Target. But other times, they can depict real things that have an indirect association to those that they symbolize. For example, the Lacoste Crocodile, also known as the Izod, if you remember from the 80s, for those of us that lived back then. You are so cool. Uh, it's derived from the founder, Rene Lacoste's nickname. Nothing to do with the company itself. It had to do with the, the founder in a very indirect way. See you around, Izod. But sometimes they can be utterly abstract. For example, Chase Bank's Octagon icon, they were focused on seeking iconic status with their logo. So they wanted to be like, you know, Nike's wing or, or Apple's logo or the golden arches for McDonald's. That's what they were going after more than, you know, having some sort of directly relatable meaning uh, at the time of creation. And then we have Bass Ale's Red Triangle. It's one of the oldest logos in the world. It's credited as being the first registered logo ever. Really? Yep. It huh. is completely 
unrelated yeah. to anything. It's not beer. <laughs> but it still works because it made the brand identifiable by sight. And the feeling that it conjured, oh, right? Red, red had the whole scarlet color, like you're doing something, oh, I'm drinking. Naughty. Yeah. So it, it, it did tackle what it was supposed to, even though it wasn't, had any hidden meaning in it uh, as far as the, the logo symbolism itself. So number two uh, type of logo is the word mark. Yes. Now, this is simply a stylized word. It's typography. But it's not as simple as simply selecting a rarely used font. No. It's not. creating art from letters and colors. Now, some examples of this are Disney, Facebook, Sony. Now, the, now what we have next is what is known as the letter mark. Okay, so this is almost a combination of the icon and the word mark styles. I'm getting fancy. So uh, in it, we see stylized letters that form an icon. So it's a hybrid, okay? Uh, examples of this in include uh, Hewlett Packard, Coco Chanel, and uh, General Electric. Fourth, we have what is called, ready? The combination mark. <laughs> I thought the last one was a combination. You would okay. be wrong, sir. So uh, what is officially known as a combination mark is a combination of the word mark and the icon, not a mix, not a hybrid, but a combination. So honestly, most icon logos start as combination marks. And then the brand eventually grows in its awareness and its acceptance. And the brand can drop their name from the mark. But it's generally an icon with the logo, with the name with it. So examples of that include Hawaiian Airlines, uh, Adidas, Sprint. There are oh so many of these. Because like I said, most of them start out that way. And then, you know, once Apple became a household name, and everybody knew their logo, they could take their name off, and the logo itself was strong enough to stand. It's like Amazon. Well, you see, um, uh, a few years ago, we noticed that McDonald's uh, started doing that with their restaurants. Uh, it used to always have the, the arches and then the name McDonald's. Now, new restaurants, new McDonald's that are coming up, don't even bother with the name because they don't have to. Taco that's, Bell's trying to do that, too, and so is Arby's. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Arby's has another logo they use that's just their little name of their business. Kind of lame. But well, um, they've separated their icon and their name, mm -hmm. and they're using both separately now. Because you, you recognize that the Arby's logo, the, the part that's not the name of their store, is like a cowboy hat, right. sort of sort of artistically. Right. So anyway, that to say. We're on to the final one. Okay. Lastly, the emblem. Yes. Uh, emblem logos have the brand name within the graphic. Okay, so examples of this would include um, Harley Davidson, the NFL, uh, Starbucks, and uh, what's another one? Burger King. The King of Burgers. Burger, Burger King. Woo! This is a lot of information to take in. <laughs> Who knew logo design was so complex? I did. I did. <laughs> but we are going to take a break for our sponsors, and when we come back... More discussion on the importance and process of proper logo design. I was so nervous. I had never done anything like this before. It took courage, stamina. It was exactly what I've been dreaming of since I was a little girl. The road was hard, but we made it together, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Everything was absolutely perfect, exactly what we wanted. They respect me, and I owe it to them to be the best that I can. They meet my needs, and they're all I've ever wanted. They were exactly what I was looking for. These aren't couples. They're business owners and customers talking about their journeys and business relationships. The study of relationship building has many parallels in both couples and business. Join B. Zachary Bennett in his new book, Married to Marketing, where he uses this comparison to walk through the process and commitment of owning a business and building relationships with customers and creating your story. 
Order Married to Marketing by B. Zachary Bennett today. Available on Amazon.com in paperback, ebooks, and audiobook. Owning and running a business takes commitment. So much commitment you are married to it. And in that marriage comes responsibilities. If you don't keep her happy, if you don't keep him happy, you won't be in business for long. I tried to make it a quick read for business people. There's a lot of great content, but it's not war and peace. Your business is a marriage of company and consumer. And in that commitment, you are married to marketing. Married to Marketing by B. Zachary Bennett is available on Amazon.com in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Limited edition numbered and signed copies available on bzacharybennett.com or at Zachary Speaking Events. Order now. Logo design is just one small subset of branding, but the logo or brand mark remains the centerpiece of most branding strategies. And it's often the most judged and criticized part of a new identity by the public. Um, It's important to remember that when we look at something, anything, we never read first. We don't read anything ever. Before anything else, we see color, we see shape. It's um, if that's enough to kind of hold of our hold our attention, then we'll read. So that's one of the reasons why the logo element within the brand picture or strategy, as you said, is so important. All visual elements are founded, grounded by the logo from where these elements start. All of your marketing tools start with the logo. The psychology behind logo design allows your logo to truly connect with consumers by connecting with them emotionally and making them think twice. That's through using these elements, color and shape, as well as the others. So what do you mean by connect? How or why does a logo connect with people emotionally? Um, a logo is akin to a loved one's face. So when you think of a person who has impacted your life, you're most certainly going to picture what they look like. Same thing with brands that we buy from. We can easily picture their logo just by thinking about our experiences with the product, company, service. It is an emotional Connection. It is a relationship between company and consumer. So let's talk about making it emotional and connective. Okay. You mentioned color and shape. Yeah. So now you're going to see logo design more as a science than artistic expression. It is a learned skill. All right. So here's the sciencey stuff. Oh, joy. Show me your nerd, babe. Our minds are conditioned to respond to color. We all know that red means stop and green means go. Yellow means go faster. (laughs) So we have to remember what we've been conditioned to when it comes to the meaning of certain colors. But humans also have an emotional connection with colors. So there's the natural response and then there's how we feel. When we talk about color, different colors make us feel different ways. So if you see red in a context other than a stop sign or a street light, you may think of love, passion, Valentine's Day, Mm. romance, uh, or sometimes danger. Now, green, on the other hand, may invoke a feeling of life, growth, nature, and sometimes money. Yes. Now, all of this psychology should be considered and evident in logo design. It is a behavioral science. What type of feeling do you want your brand to convey? Do you want to come across as trustworthy or do you want to scream creativity? Always. Right? Psychologically, what is it that you want? But it goes even further. Even further? 
Companies also use the psychology of color to motivate certain physical responses from their audience. Have you ever wondered why restaurants are red? Well, it's because red stimulates hunger. Black and white in logo design can demonstrate elegance and sophistication, but it's always best to stick with one or two colors to deliver your message, if you can. The best logos are simple, so don't go crazy with color. Now, this decision on color comes back to what you want your company to stand for, right? What are your brand standards? That's why it's important to have a brand vision, a business vision, before you jump into something like designing your logo. Just for fun, let's talk about a few colors here. Oh boy. For the listening slash watching audience, you can play along with us. I am going to pick a few colors and Zachary, you tell me what they mean. And then you can turn the tables around on me. Sound good? Okay. Okay. So we're going to go, you go one, I go one? That sounds good. All right. Um, purple. Yeah, I picked his favorite color first. Purple, purple means royalty. Mm. It means luxury. Yes. It means uh, wisdom and dignity. It's creative. Uh, it can symbolize um, being wise, musical. The artist formerly known as yes, Purple. Yes, all of the, that's why his brand chose Purple. Purple, Prince, royalty, creativity. You see how the package is all coming together? Yes. Do you guys see right. the wall behind me? Purple. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, so you pick a color. I'm going to pick one. Let's do, uh, let's do yellow. Yellow. Okay. Yellow symbolizes intellect, mm -hmm. friendliness, warmth. It also invokes caution yeah. and Cowardice. That's right. Hmm. You're yellow, Betty. That meant you were coward. Right. But for me, yellow invokes optimism and warmth and sometimes clarity. Hmm. Right, right. Okay. Your turn. My turn. Okay. Let's uh, just do two more. Then okay, then we'll green. On. Green uh, represents um, growth. Difference? Yeah, we already did. Green already okay. How about gray? Um, gray um, can give you the, can make you think of authority. That stems from the fact that a lot of government buildings are gray. A lot of government things are gray. Now, you know. I thought that was boring. But okay. Cart, cart before the horse, whichever came first, I'm not sure. Uh, chicken or the egg. Cement. Uh, but it means, it, it symbolizes authority. It also symbolizes maturity, um, security, stability, nice. right? Things that you think of when you think of uh, an, an, an older, wiser uh, person that has been there and done that. It can also make you think of, um, you know, balance. Right. Okay. You pick another one. Oh, my turn. Last my one, turn. Last one. Um, let's do. What have we not done? Roll the wheel, Johnny. What are the colors? Uh, let's do white. White. That's right. That is the absence of all color and the presence of yes. all light. White. White is a symbol of hope, simplicity, cleanliness. Cleanliness. True. Goodness. Purity, right? Um, for me, it is. It's a very, it's a very clean color. It's also a very basic color. Okay, that was fun. Yeah. Now, talk to me a, a bit more about the hidden messages in logos. You mentioned Amazon and FedEx already. Yeah, hidden, hidden is a bit much. Um, let's call it subliminal. Ha, okay. If if that's any better, um, but it's definitely clever either way. Now. Amateur designers have a hard time thinking outside of the box. They often think that their logo design must have something to do with what the company does, mm -hmm. um, which may seem like, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? But uh, let me illustrate it this way by giving you an example, okay? Um, they would think that a plumbing company must have a plunger or a uh, toilet or something in their logo, yeah. okay? Or that a travel agency must have an airplane or some sort of beach element in it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, you know, it. those are things that are, are very, very literal, right? Literal, what the company does. Therefore, you know, this represents that. And while it can be, you know, that simple, that direct, it doesn't always have to be that 
cut and dry. It can also be about what the company believes in, right? Some of the best logo designs have messages within them that you may not notice after such a quick glance. Ooh, and I would like to talk about some of those. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so um, some of those are just rumors. Some of the ones that people have heard of are just rumors. Things like Coca-Cola having a tribute to Denmark uh, within their logo or Wendy's logo saying mom. Uh, but others are obviously intentional. So we'll go over some of the more intentional examples. So I'll pick out some of what are my favorites, and then you do the same. Okay. Um, and we'll we'll throw them up on the screen. So my one of my favorite that has these sort of um, you know understated, not uh, cliche clip art sort of. Uh, elements in their logo would be the Pittsburgh Zoo. Oh, I like that one. The Pittsburgh Zoo has uh, two animal figures that are in their logo, but it's in the negative space underneath a uh, safari tree, or, or I don't know what kind of, what kind of tree this is. But <laughs> uh, but uh, if you look in the negative space, you could see a gorilla and a female lion. And I just think that the way that that was put together was so smart and yet understated and yet it made it to my list so whoever this designer was good job yeah good for you so what's one what's one of yours that you know of well i really like the goodwill logo mm -hmm. now people might you know say oh well i know what it is it's a smiley face because you know you see like half a smiley face right above the actual words goodwill mm -hmm. but what people usually don't catch is that it's not only a half of a smiley face it's also the lowercase g that is actually the G in Goodwill. That's right. That's right. So there's a smiley face G. Yeah, because when you think <laughs> of Goodwill, you should be thinking of smiling faces. Like, that's the whole point. Yep. Uh, another one of the ones that I like, uh, and this is, is one, of the, one of the most well done, I think, and that is Tostitos. Tostitos. Tostitos, if you look closely, the two interior T's, the ones that are in the middle, are... Two guys, and you know their their arms are stretched out. That's the cross to the T, and they're sharing a bowl of salsa with a chip, probably a Tostitos chip. I would hope so. <laughs> and I think I think that goes unnoticed by a lot of people that just kind of look at it. I'm surprised you didn't talk about the the Sony Vio. I like the Sony Vio one too. That one's a little more complicated, and I actually don't know if they're in business anymore, so people know who they are. Uh, we'll 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 throw it up. I think um, people probably recognize the logo, even the, if you don't know what the company does. Yeah. Now, do you do you know the parts of this logo? I do. I know that the first half of the logo, uh, well, actually both halves represent a digital and analog technology. Mm -hmm. yes. So you've got the first part. The VA, or yeah, I guess it would be the VA, because the name of the company is Vio. It's actually V A I O. Right. And if you were to hand write that out, it looks ridiculous. <laughs> but we all recognize what it looks, what the logo looks like. Um, but yeah, so like the first part is like digital sound waves, and then the I O is what analog, or is it the other way around? The other way around. Oh. The 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 first. This is part, why I thought you'd like it because you're you're a sound guy. The first one is an analog uh, audio wave, mm -hmm. uh, and oh. then the second one is digital. It's it's co it's uh, the IO, you know the yeah ones it's and codes zeros. ones and zeros. Yeah. Ah okay. So uh, yeah, and they do electronics, which is why it makes it makes sense. Well, one of my favorite ones, honestly, is the Big Ten logo. Now this is interesting to me because. It's actually kind of like a word mark, but, you know, because it's got the name of what it is, Big right. Ten Conference, in it. But what's interesting about this particular logo is as recently another team was added to the Big Ten Conference, which makes it ridiculous. Well, yes, because it's no longer 10. Now it's like the Big now, 11. Now, you probably have to explain to people what is the Big Ten Conference. It's football. Okay. If you don't know, you just get on out. <laughs> Well, actually, the Big Ten Conference is like the SEC, only not as cool. How about that? Okay. Okay. Um, the Big Ten we're from the South. We're from the South. <laughs> um, Big Ten Conference. So they added this other team, right? And instead of changing the logo to say Big 11, which is clunky and reinventing the and, brand. Yeah, everybody already knows Big Ten. It's yeah, a it's thing. a Big Ten. It's, now, it's at this branded. point, it just rolls off the tongue. Right. So what they decided to do instead when they added this extra team is they brought the 11 into the logo. So, and how they brought it into the logo is by pulling it out of the white space. Okay, yes. so what I mean by that is right on either side of the T in Big Ten, 
you can see the numbers one and one on either side. And if you really look at it, that's where they snuck in the 11. I just think it's brilliant. Yeah. It's yeah. one of those logos I look at as a graphic designer and think that they are so much smarter than I am. <laughs> okay. There's one more that we'll talk about. Um, one that I think most people are probably aware of, and that is Baskin Robbins. Yum. So Baskin Robbins, for those of you that don't know, it may, they make ice cream. You don't know. Um, you better get on out. <laughs> <laughs> they make ice cream, and they are known for having 31 flavors. And if you look at their logo, there is a three and a one hidden. Not hidden. Not but, really. <laughs> but there within the logo. They better they better stick to 31 because if they do 32, they're kind of they're kind of screwed. <laughs> they will never say more than 31 or less than. Or 31. maybe they'll say BR plus, so it'd be like Baskin <laughs> Robbins plus. So, anyways. Yep. So those are those are some of the logos that I think are uh, are have those kind of additional meanings. There's lots of other ones. Uh, LG has one. Toblerone has one. Um, uh, Ooh, Tour, the, the Milwaukee Brewers. Milwaukee Brewers have Milwaukee one too. Milwaukee Brewers, if you're a Brewers fan, which which sounds it. like it, it's alcohol, but it's not. Well, it is actually because that's where Milwaukee is beer. Well, is brewed. yeah, yeah, it's not a, it's not a beer brand though. No, no, it's definitely <laughs> baseball. Anyway, we'll put up more examples throughout the next few weeks on our social media because I think these are fun. And you can find our social media links anywhere on our website, straightshot.net. Okay, we can move on now. Okay. Okay. I, I do think those are fun. Enough, to, enough of the activities for the moment? Well, for the moment. <laughs> um, not required by the science of logo design, but an added bonus whenever possible, the hidden, yes. hidden things. Now, the other element you mentioned was shape. Can you talk a little bit more about shape? Okay, yeah. Um, like color, our minds interpret shapes differently okay. as well. Um, that's why when designing a logo, you need to be conscious of every single line, curve, jagged edge that you come up with. Devil's in the details, kids. Absolutely. Now, did you know, you probably know. I probably did. <laughs> that a vertical line is typically associated with being masculine, having strength and aggression, whereas a horizontal line is considered to communicate uh, tranquility and community. Now, a diagonal line symbolizes movement, either positive or negative, depending on which direction the line is going. Okay. So that makes sense. And jagged lines showcase excitement or being edgy or chaotic. And that's just lines. All right, now, so shapes, no matter how complex they are, are broken down and construed in our minds in their most basic form. Okay? okay. So uh, you've heard that, um, you know, everything, that every drawing is just made up of a bunch of different shapes. Shapes that are, layered are on together. top of shapes. Well, your mind interprets those and it breaks them down. It breaks down those, uh, those shapes. So understanding the psychological effects of certain shapes will allow a designer to better tell the story of a company's brand. So circles... Mm -hmm right, a round object, it can show positive emotion and interconnectivity. It reminds us of things like marriage and partnership and stability. Squares, on the other hand, they have, you know, straight lines and, you know, sharp edges. And the, the shape of the square displays balance mm. and uh, fortitude. It can portray characteristics such as strength and professionalism and Efficiency. You remember in the 50s when uh, all the cool kids called their parents squares? Yeah. Well, that's because they were... They were efficient. Yeah, perfectly <laughs> in proportion. Uh, now, triangles. Triangles tend to give the feeling of power and hierarchy. They're commonly associated with things like science and religion or law and lawlessness. Now, knowing a company's core values will give you a strong idea on what type of direction you should be taking with shape and design for the logo. Now, the more you understand a company, the better a logo you can produce by applying these science type principles. You know, science has a lot to do with lots of things mm -hmm. in, in marketing. 
it's, it's all about science. It is. I tell people all the time what, what we use is a more scientific approach. It's not, uh, you know, it's not haphazard. It's not throw it against the wall. We don't it's, use it's just very, what looks pretty. Yeah. There's, there's a there's, method to the madness. There's thinking behind all of it. I prefer to think of it as a method to the madness. Mm. Well, there's one more element. Well, at least that you haven't really spoken about it. You've spoken okay. a little bit about it, but I'd like you to go into a little bit more detail about typography. Now, I know a lot of people don't really know what typography is, so I'll go ahead and break it down real quick. It's font choice. The fonts you use say a lot about your company. That's why brand guidelines have font choices listed in them and why professional companies have brand police that ensure employees are using the official fonts in their emails, reports, newsletters, proposals, things like that. Yeah, um, all of those things, including typography fonts, go into logo design as well. This is one of the easiest elements for customers to digest. Uh, each font tells its own slightly different story. Uh, and there's families of fonts. So choosing the right font is critical in setting the standard for whatever the brand is going to be. For example, uh, different families. A uh, sans serif font like Helvetica, for example, it paints a much different feel for a company than a script font like, say, Lobster. Uh, and I know I'm throwing out font, na font names and a lot of, of people don't, don't know the font families and all of that. But, um, you know, these are some of the reasons. It's one of the reasons you don't see Comic Sans used in business a lot um, because it's just it's, it's not appropriate. All right. I have another, like, just fair warning to all those people out there creating <laughs> I think you logo. talked about Comic Sans the episode before. I am going to warn everybody I'm going, I'm going to encourage our listeners. I'm going to say it this way. I'm going to encourage our listeners to never use Comic <laughs> Sans unless you are running a daycare. Uh, it's a very childlike font and not in a good way. It's also very amateurish looking font, not in a good way. Not that that would be good anyway. Uh, please don't use Comic Sans and also be really leery of papyrus. If you don't know what papyrus is, Google it. You'll figure it out and you'll be like, oh, I remember that. And then you'll hate it just like I do. <laughs> anyway. Back to fonts. Yes. So let's go through what certain fonts say to people. Uh, let's just take a few of the most popular fonts okay. and talk about them. We'll identify the font and the font type. We'll talk about where they are used most commonly and the feelings that they give off or, you know, how they add to a company's story. How's that sound? Okay. So um, there are, there's probably more than this, but we're going to talk about the five most basic font families okay okay um there's uh the serif font which is um the one that has feet uh-huh a slight projection that's finishing off a stroke of a letter in a certain typeface yeah you saw uh ser and this is before typewriters guys you would see this with calligraphy the whole finishing of letters that's that's what makes this not, stand not the out. curly cue parts of calligraphy but like no the, no no the, when it, the, the feet yeah it looks like it has feet <laughs> if you look at an individual character or a letter you can see that it looks like it's standing up on feet or it's got yep. its feet in the air. Now, uh, these types of fonts are typically used for things like uh, corporate events. Um, they uh, are associated with being reliable, impressive, respectable, uh, traditional. And uh, a couple of examples of these are um, Times New Roman. Everybody's heard of that. Uh, Garamond, Baskerville. Georgia. Yeah, these are ones that if you've ever had to do an online designer or you've ever had to pick out fonts for anything you've ever had custom made, you, these are very common fonts yes. that you run into. Yep. But you'll know the difference now because the ones that he just listed have feet. Yep. Now, the what are the ones that don't have feet? The counterpart to that is called sans serif. Sans feet. Because they are without feet. The best way to remember it is it's either feet or without feet. Right. Now, sans is French for without. So that's where that comes is from. That, I think it's Latin, isn't it? No, no, it's French. So, so some examples of those would be Helvetica, like we mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, other ones that people know. Um, Ariel. Uh, yeah, Ariel. Calibri. Verdana. Now, these are associated with being objective. It's very clean, um, you know, stable, universal, those sorts of things. 
And then there is another type of serif. Now, again, we're talking about serif is the feet. So we've got feet, no feet, and slab feet. Slab <laughs> serif. Slab serif. These are uh, blocky fonts, typically used for like festivals and concerts and things mm -hmm. like that. And you'll notice that not only do they have that foot or that platform down toward the bottom, but it's a raised platform. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's sitting on a, on a box, basically. Um, some examples of a slab serif font, again, festivals, concerts, fun things like that. Rockwell, Courier, Clarendon. I'm sure many of us have used that one before. <laughs> So yeah, and the you know the image that it, the the emotion that that invokes is you know it's bold, strong, modern, and funky. 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 <laughs> All right. Yep. Uh, and then there are there's two more that we're going to go over today. There's the scripty fonts, which everybody knows. Not right? always cursive, though. No, no, not always. And these are typically used for dinner and cocktails and, and, and that sort of stuff. Fancy. Um, they are uh, associated with being feminine or elegant, uh, friendly, or even creative. And uh, there's lots of different types of uh, script fonts. Yeah, usually the serif fonts, whether they're sans serif or serif, those are usually ones that most people use to write copy in a book. And then some of these scripts, and uh, the next one is going to be uh, modern, these are more decorative fonts. Script can be something that looks like a signature, you know, something like cursive. Yeah. But there's also ones like Lobster, and um, I think it's called Zappino. Zapfino. Zapfino. I think Lucinda is one that people Lucinda, know, Or too. Brush Script. Yeah, yeah. Brush Script is used a lot for monograms, mm -hmm. things like that. Usually. It's Typically, these are the ones that you will use when you're trying to digitally sign a document. Because <laughs> right. they look more like a signature than something else. They're fancy. Yeah. They're very fancy. Um, so, yeah, now we can talk about um, modern, which is our last family. Yes, this is our last you know, big category of, of fonts. Like... So then there's modern. So modern is also kind of fancy, sort of like script, but totally different. Um, modern is for private events, mm -hmm. things like that. It is, uh, it is kind of a skinny, tall font. And it is uh, this, the associations with modern fonts are that they are exclusive, fashionable, stylish, sharp. And intelligent, which is interesting mm -hmm. because a lot of the a lot of brands that are focused around maybe intelligent software or, or something will use a tall, skinny font. And that's what we would call a yep. modern font. Now, one of the things that you'll notice about these is these are are serif fonts. No feet. They're, no feet. So uh, you know the they're, they're, the stress on these is that they're vertical. They're up and down. They're thin. They're they're very. Um, Modern. <laughs> Modern, for lack of lack of a better word. Yeah, very clean lines. Um, clean. So, Clean's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a little bit about fonts and, and typography and that sort of thing. And I think we have completely exhausted everything that I know to think of off the top of my head about logo design. Never. <laughs> Never. The thing with fonts that's interesting for you guys listening is, you know, if you've ever had a an opportunity to have something custom made – and somebody offers you a whole bunch of fonts and you don't know where to begin, I mean, it can be very overwhelming. I mean, there are, gosh, oh, hundreds of thousands there, of fonts out there. there's more made every day. Yeah, anybody can make a font. So, I mean, there's just tons of fonts out there. So shop around a little bit, but don't go too crazy. Know whether or not you want it to have feet. That's the start. And why? Because if you want it to be very professional and if you want it to be very bold, well, you might want to do something with, like, the block, the... um. What is it? The slab serif. If you want something that's really sleek and intelligent, uh, like that's your brand or that's what you're going for, well, then you're going to want to do something that's sans feet, mm -hmm. sans serif, and skinny and tall and modern. So just that gives you kind of a jumping off point of how to pick these fonts. Now, a lot of companies, now these, these are not, not small businesses, but a lot of larger businesses, they will make custom fonts. So we can make a font around the character of the company. So a lot of, particularly sometimes they don't make the whole font. Sometimes they just make the, the logo, but the logo is based on certain fonts and then we can change and add to them uh, yes. in our design. But the rules behind the fonts, the characteristics are something that we still, you know, need to follow. Absolutely. I know that for our agency logo, 
Reformation Productions. The R in Reformation is custom. Yes. And then F formation is actually a different font. The R is a different font than F formation. Yes. E form. That, that, that makes it where we can't just type it. Well, uh, yeah, no, it's a nightmare. But uh, but you know, we were uh, conscious, conscious, conscience, conscious, conscious. Yes, conscious. we were aware uh, of picking that for a specific reason. We like the the fancy detail. But you, if you have an idea of what your brand, your company is, and what they're about, and the feelings you want your customers to get, that's the starting point. Now, guys, there are a lot of tools in a designer's tool belt, reasonings, guidelines, but that doesn't mean that you can't break the rules, just like we were saying with ours. Though it does mean that you should have some pretty good reason for breaking the rules. So, Zachary, what's our straight shot for today? What is our conclusion from all this we've learned here? Well, um, logo design is the developed skill that comes down to knowing the company. Mm -hmm. There's so much that if you either have to know the company, and if you're the company, you have to know the customer. There's a lot of cerebral stuff going on here. And the better that you understand the brand and the company culture, the easier it will be for you to connect with their customers through logo design. A logo is supposed to have meaning, a personality on, on its own, all on its own. And uh, above all, it identifies the company. So while describing what the company is about, it identifies the company. That is the bottom line. Now, before I go, a few pieces of advice for all of the would-be designers out there. Things that we follow at our agency, Reformation Productions, when we are designing logos for clients. Uh, Jen, can you jump in here? Um, you know what these are. Matter of fact, you can start. You go, and then I'll go, and, and we'll I kind of give people. I will be happy to do we'll that. Give this our, is so my list. wheelhouse. I would say 90% of what we talk about is your wheelhouse. This is totally my <laughs> wheelhouse. One piece of advice, the first piece of advice I would say. First, number one on the list. Number one. It's to go easy on the effects. Now, in the world of Photoshop and Illustrator, we have the ability to manipulate every aspect of a logo, just like I said with Reformations R. But remember, less is more. And these effects will only complicate things in the logo's future. If you choose to use one or more of these effects, make sure that your logo does not depend on it. All right. So, number two. Number two. Look at your design from every angle. A logo okay. may look great against a white background and up close and right side up, but your logo will also be placed on all kinds of promo items and marketing materials. So you also need to look at it on different color backgrounds at, from different distances. Uh, there are some embarrassing oh. <laughs> and inappropriate logos out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, just look up bad logos on the internet. You'll see what I mean. So okay. make sure that you're not only looking at it on your computer screen. Uh, again, advice for, for both, you know, the guy that, that uh, is designing it and the company that's buying the design. Make sure you've, Spend some time with your logo design before yes. you set it off to press. Now, one of the things you'll see if you do Google, which I totally encourage you to do it, it's a laugh <laughs> riot. If you Google bad logo designs, one of the things that you'll see is perhaps a decent design, but what they don't account for is what you see in the negative space, right? So, or the white space that... what. Sometimes images appear in your logo <laughs> unintentionally. So that's part of what Zachary is saying is to just make sure that you look at the spaces in between your letters, the spaces in between your graphics, mm. just because you don't want anything. In it. We don't want phallic objects popping out of our logo unless that's you're intending to do that. In, unless in, you do. In, in, yes, you do. <laughs> uh, okay, so speaking of a, a white space, a blank space. Okay, so white space. Use white space appropriately. Now, white or negative space gives a logo balance. Now, do you know what white space and what, what that is? It's basically air around your logo and in between all the characters and everything like that. It gives it balance. It can also act as another creative element without crowding. Like the Pittsburgh logo. Like, like, the, like the Pittsburgh logo, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or like the Big Ten logo. Mm -hmm. um, 
big 11, whatever. <laughs> white space gives you the opportunity to add those hidden elements like you're suggesting, but watch out for the inappropriate spaces. Just saying. Right. We don't want a penis uh, popping up anywhere that we don't want a penis popping up. <laughs> All right. So next, we have to remember that logos are more than just a cool symbol or font. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have to give them what they're due. Logos are intended to be the identifiable face of a company. Logos don't necessarily sell the company or the product, but they do identify it. And over time, that will help with building a relationship with your consumers. So be thoughtful, be smart, and be purposeful in the logo design. Yes. Another piece of advice Keep about logos? Avoid using rainbows of color. I'm not making a political statement here. I'm just trying to say. <laughs> like we touched earlier, color is very important. However... Considering that the top 100 brands in the world, 95% of them use only one or two colors in your logo or in their logos. And if it is necessary to use multiple colors, like, you know, the Olympics or Google, Google celebrates yeah. using all those colors, make sure that the logo also works in one color as well um, for a couple reasons. Number one, you never know where your logo will be printed. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have... Uh, a red t-shirt and your your logo has red in it, well, then that will disappear. That right. Those parts are... <laughs> so you might need to have a, at least a version that is all white or all black, always. Um, and the logo still has to work that way. That's that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, if you have you know a multicolored logo and you have parts on the inside of the design that overlap, if you make it one color, that overlap can't be seen. Absolutely. So just be mindful about how the logo might be used, which is why a lot of these big companies have one or two logos. Plus, honestly, think about printing costs, people. A lot of times people will come to me with logos that are multicolored, beautiful, but they want a one color, you know, printout of something. They want, you know, like a one color print of a t-shirt. And I'm like, I can't, your logo is multiple colors. I can't do a one print unless we change the logo, in which case, like Zachary said, we might be erasing a lot of great detail in there if I make it all one color. So just be mindful of how much money it costs per color. And if you intend to have a lot of printed products, well, it's going to cost money. Um, anyway, always make sure one color works because it will happen at some point. Yes. Um, next thing, um, be original. Don't copy somebody else's design. You mm. want to be different and recognizable in the marketplace. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting inspired by the competition, but copying is just wrong, Bad. illegal in some cases, and self-defeating. Stand out on your own. Mm. The last thing that you want to have is a logo that is mistaken for somebody else's because then it's not doing its purpose, which is identifying you. Right. If you get your logo mistaken with somebody else's, you can end up in court. Okay. And if you lose, you will need to rebrand the entire company or product line from square one. What a waste of money. Yes. So just be do inspired. It, do it right the first time. Don't be, you know, illegal. Yeah. Remember, folks, kiss. Keep it simple. Stupid. <laughs> That's what that means. The simpler the logo, the more recognizable it will be. Uh, one of the examples uh, of that is the Apple logo, right? Yeah. Very simple. One of the examples of it not being simple is Starbucks. Now, they did a pretty good job making a complicated logo very simple still. So keeping it simple. Break your logo down to only the absolute essentials. Do you really need that background element? Are all the colors that you have there necessary? Is the name even necessary within the design? All of these questions and more should be asked before you present your logo to the world. All right. And then lastly, don't ever, ever use any AI software, clip art, or Fiverr. Mm. Uh, now, for those of you that don't know what AI software is, that stands for artificial intelligence. Um, thing. You know, things that, you know, you punch it in and then poof, it just it generates, automatic, automatically generated comes out with one. Right. Generated uh, logos. Logos are too important. 
They require attention to detail, thought, and skill, and personalized focus. In a world of you get what you pay for, don't shortcut your logo. It's number two behind the brand name. It's not about how difficult it looks to make. It's about the thought process, the skills, and the experience that got it made correctly. So a lot of people think, oh, it's easy. It's, it's just a target. Yes, but the thinking and everything that went behind, it, it's like we've said this entire show, it's not as easy as, as one might think. <laughs> yes, and I, that, that is the last point, but I'm still going to piggyback off of that and say, not only should you not use a generated software, but also be careful when you use your like 13-year-old niece or nephew to do it. Because again, although they might know how to work a computer better than you do, it doesn't necessarily mean they've put the thought in and right. have the skill set to do logos. Now, the, the other thing is, and, and I, I see this a lot on social media, you posting something and saying, here's four different designs, help me pick one. It doesn't matter what Guys, they want. Guys, uh, it's again, it is a thought out decision. It's, it's not about what's aesthetically pleasing to your friends. Unless your friend is one of your target customers and then, you know, then their opinion matters. Um, but it, it, again, this is not an art contest. This has to do with what's going to help represent your company in a way that's going to be identifiable mm -hmm. in the marketplace. The end. Okay, but it's not the end because I thought of one more. <laughs> Just one more. One more. I, I, could, I know, I'm a graphic designer. I could do this all day, but... Another one is don't be, well, I guess it's two, but don't be, <laughs> <laughs> don't be trendy. Understand that the decision that you make for your logo is something you must live with. Your right. business must live with that logo. And you can change it a little bit over the years by maybe taking out the name of your company and using just the icon part. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, you have to be able to live with this logo. So it must be something you do really, really like. There are uh, logo designs that happen every several decades. Like uh, uh, Pepsi Cola has changed their logo slightly. That's um, because they were a direct rip off they, of Coca-Cola at they first. They spent tons of tons and tons of money doing it. Um, but they're always grounded in that first one. So if they do a redesign of the logo, if it's not correcting something that was bad to begin with, mm -hmm. um, it's usually just slight tweaks uh, on the design to, to make the make the design more, more update. But that core, that core is something that you have to live right. with. Right, and Pepsi, true. at that point, when Pepsi decided to change their logo, they had earned it because they were already recognized as a yeah. brand. Yep. They didn't have to worry about alienating. And, or they, and they kept a lot lost. of the same brain elements that they've had before. Mm -hmm. They just had an had a updated design. They didn't consider it changing. They considered it evolving. Yes, yes. The, evolve, uh, the logos may evolve. They That's can evolve, but they Wal don't Walmart's don't logo has evolved. Absolutely. We were just talking about that. The last thing I will say, and this kind of went with the last thing, is um, you get what you pay for. Zachary already said that. So um, invest in it. Get somebody professional to do your logo. Okay, I'm done, I guess, for that. It's been very, this has all been extremely informative. I hope that our listeners got stuff out of it. I hope that, um, that this will help them make better choices in the future. They also need to know this stuff. It can help them in hiring someone to do their logo and evaluating what they get. True. I know that for me personally, I spend a good deal of my time receiving logos from clients who have already had their logo done somewhere else. They give it to me. I use it to put on different things. And if it's not vector, if it's not sized appropriately, <laughs> if it's not, um, if the logos are all like, you can hand me two different kinds of logos. They look totally different with different colors in them. That be, presents a problem for the graphic designers that you work with. So if we can jump ahead of that, you'll save time in the future when you use graphic designers uh, for different things. If you have a product, you know, product labeling, things like that, your logo will be smattered all over all that. You'll probably have to work with a separate graphic designer to create product labels. Make sure that you're handing them a font that they can use. Uh, well, a lot of times we've had to recreate a logo because they had, they had it made before. They lost the files or, mm -hmm. or don't want to talk to the guy that designed it or something. Oh my gosh. And we have to recreate what somebody else has made. You've just brought up something important that I'd like to share with the listeners. This is a very valuable piece of advice, not just in creating your logo, which Zachary did an excellent job setting up how they should create a logo. One thing that you also need to know is 
how to save a logo. Once a, la once a logo is created, it needs to be vectorized. Now, what does that mean? That means in layman's terms, Google it for all the fanciness, but in layman's terms, it means that that logo can be stretched out as tall and wide without losing pixelation. It won't get fuzzy. It needs to be an SVG file, guys. It needs to be an <laughs> SVG or it can be a vector PDF. It just needs to be vectorized. Now, if you have a graphic designer build it for you, first of all, kudos. Make sure that you, first of all, you shouldn't have to tell them this, but make sure that you receive from them a vector file. So if you ever want to put your logo on a billboard that is huge by huge, <laughs> we can do that for you without it getting fuzzy, losing resolution. If you pull some garbage that you found off the internet, like you're just like, oh, I, you know, I saw it on Facebook and I right clicked save as I'm going to hurt you <laughs> because it is a low resolution, small, either JPEG, which is the, you know, the extension at the end dot JPG or dot PNG. If it's a ping file or a JPEG, it's probably too small and it's limited in colors and lines. So you're definitely going to want to make sure that you have your beautiful logo that's simple and colored perfectly, typography, font choice specific. When you're all done with that, make sure you have vector copies of that file. Because if you have a vector copy, I can do anything with it for you. But if you hand me a, a, a logo that is a PNG or a JPEG, I probably am going to have to remake the logo, in which case that will cost a lot more money because graphic designers usually work by the hour. <laughs> anyway, so that would be my last um, big push just to make sure that that's how you have your logos because if you have a vector logo, the sky is the limit. Okay, that's it. Okay, <laughs> please don't forget, guys, to like and subscribe. It really helps us on all the social media platforms. And if you really like us, you can go to other platforms and like and subscribe there as well. We kind of get around. We're everywhere. YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, yeah. uh, podcast app, Stitcher, everywhere, right? Pandora. Pandora, I Spotify, iHeartRadio, <laughs> whatever. It really does help us out if you go, if you're, if wherever you are listening to us, if you could just click the like button, click subscribe, that tells us that what we're doing is good. It will continue to make great content for you. Um, like everything, just whatever. Subscribe everywhere. Hit notifications, <laughs> all that stuff. Follow our social media so that you can, you know, hear the, or see the teaser videos and all the, the stuff that we put up that kind of helps each one of these episodes. And, and, and if you don't do it for you so that you get notifications, do it for us because the platforms like it. I mean, <laughs> if, just saying. if you like us, it would help if you told us. <laughs> Girl likes a compliment every once in a while. Anyway. You can also text the word reformation, that's reformation, to the number 90210 to be notified directly by us twice each month on your cell phone. Charges may apply, whatever, depending on your service. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below or email us. I don't know that anybody actually gets charged. I know, for, but they always say that. Well, it, they used to. I will to. say that to clear my conscience. Yeah. Charges may apply. It used to, back when we used to pay by the minute for cell phone service. Yeah. Are you old enough to even remember that? No, uh -uh. I'm 12. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course I am. But, I had pagers. Uh, but now now it's 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 not really like that before. Yes. They, they used to charge us for long distance. Mm. This reminds me, there's a birthday coming up. No, there's not. Okay. Um, never mind. It's not Zachary's birthday tomorrow or a couple days. It's not. Don't worry about it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, like I said, you can always leave them, drop them at the door, meaning below in the comments, or you can email us at info at straightshot.net or call us, carrier pigeon, smoke signal. It's up to you. Anyway, until then, guys, bye. See ya. Thank you for listening. If you found this podcast informative, we hope you'll pass along our web address, straightshot.net, to your friends, colleagues, and business associates. And please leave us a positive review on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash straightshot.